machines are watching us, but we don't know what they're thinking. And so this is, I call these machines balance, the machines that are spying on us, but we don't get to know how they are thinking. So like I push the button on my TV, and I don't know if I've pushed the button. I used to just click the switch off and the TV went off. But now, in, when I was growing up in my childhood, I fixed televisions. I was the guy in the neighborhood that everybody brought their TV to fix. When I was eight years old, I had my own business repairing TV sets. And everybody in my neighborhood would bring their bucket of TV and I would fix it, or sometimes I'd go to their house and fix it for them. And I was the television expert. But now when my daughter's late watching TV and I want her to go to bed, I don't even know how to turn it off. There's no button on it to turn it off. Somewhere I push on it, and I don't, it doesn't acknowledge that I've pressed it, you see. Uh, and I press a little harder, and then it, I still don't feel any click for tactile feedback. So I presume that I haven't pressed it hard enough, and I keep pressing it harder and harder and harder until it goes off. I almost wonder if I should put a vice on it and squeeze it until it shuts off. But because it doesn't give me any immediate feedback on whether or not it's received my press. So these are called the machines of malice. They don't, you don't know what it's thinking. I don't know if the TV's acknowledged. Maybe you're supposed to wave at it in some funny hand gesture, but it never tells you. It just waits a long time. So feedback delayed is feedback denied. I made a digital light switch in my office to prove this point. I had a single button push once to turn it on and push once to turn it off. And then I introduced a random three to five second delay and a 10% packet loss. <laughs> A lot of people had trouble understanding surveillance and surveillance. I had people telling me they're the same thing, or I don't need to make up a new word because this is not really a new thing. So my six-year-old made this nice little drawing that kind of explained the difference between surveillance and surveillance. Surveillance is when you're being watched, and surveillance is when you're being watched. And this concept can apply at multiple scales, you see. Uh, if you look at smart cities and smart provinces and smart countries and smart earth and smart universe, up on this physical axis. We've got this urban scale space. And the green stuff is the environment. That's what's around us. And uh, the flesh-colored stuff, I call that the environment. That's us. That's the part that isn't the environment. And together, that's the environment, the physical scale. I call that alpha because it's related to atoms. Atomic is starts with the alpha. And then so I've got atoms, bits, and genes near the origin, which are the smallest units of physical space, informatic space, and human space. And then coming further out from these axes, I've got the physical uh, sciences, and then going in the upper axis, I've got computer science, and coming out of the page, I've got social science. So I, I, I kind of, this is kind of a three-dimensional three space that I've visualized in my conceptualization. My point is that uh, study the what we we're, we're taught in school and what we learn and all the act, activism that surrounds us is all based on the upwards extremes of the space, like the environmentalism and the environmental movement. I said there should be an environmental movement. I said when there's surveillance, there should also be surveillance. When there's environmentalism, there should also be environmentalism. When there's uh, you know big data, there should also be little data. And so my point uh, is, in my work, I'm raising attention to the need for thinking about the entire space, not just the large scales. And so I invented something called an NUI, Natural User Interface. And uh, that was kind of direct interaction. And it kind of started up my childhood. When I was growing up, this is the kind of world that I lived in. I could see a, a device like a radio there, uh, when I looked in the back, there was no back on it. It was a wide open, so I could see right inside it. And all these glass bulbs, the vacuum tubes, these lamps, you know, they're transparent technology. You could see right inside it. Not only was the technology transparent and really easy to understand and modify, but the manufacturer even put a little nice little diagram there to help you understand how it works. So these schematic diagrams are like roadmaps that the manufacturer gave. And on the other side, there was a parts list. Beautiful. You look in the back and there's a di uh, diagram showing the layout on one side and a parts list on the other. And this is the world I grew up in and I loved it and I had so much fun. Every Monday morning, which is garbage day, I'd go around the neighborhood and collect old radios that people were throwing away. People would throw away these nice uh, oak uh, cabinet radios, you know, because they were old stuff and they'd buy these smaller plastic transistor radios that were the future. And so I collected these older radios and had fun with them. And television was transparent as well. And in the early days, you could see inside the tube. 
But then came the 70s, and this is a microwave motion sensor, and I thought, that thing's spying on me. It's watching me. I wonder what it's thinking. So I opened it up to have a look inside, and then saw the numbers round off all the chips. So we went, I went from an era in which the manufacturers wanted to help me understand the world around me. Firstly, the world was easier to understand inherently, and also the manufacturers took the extra effort to make it even easier, to a world that was harder to understand inherently. And not only that, but the manufacturers took the extra effort to make it even harder to understand. So I kind of became fascinated with valence and surveillance and surveillance. And so here's a television camera, and one thing I noticed in my childhood is to move a TV set back and forth to pick up the television signal. And I noticed it would feed back on the television signal. And, uh, and this is a long exposure photograph that I took while waving a television set back and forth in front of the surveillance camera. And what this picture shows is it shows the sight field of the surveillance camera. I call it this MetaVision. That's actually the name of a company that I co-founded in Silicon Valley, California, called MetaVision. MetaVision is the vision of vision. A meta conversation is a conversation about conversations. A meta joke is a joke about jokes. Metadata is data about data. And meta vision is vision of a vision. This is a vision of vision. It's visualizing vision, sensing sensors, and sensing their capacity to sense. Is the old Latin phrase, who watches the watchers? But I don't think anybody said who watches the watching. Who watches the watchers is a political question. Who watches the watching is a mathematical question of mathematics and physics. And so that was kind of what I was asking, was who watches the watching? And so there, and then I realized I didn't need a whole entire TV set, I could use a light bulb. So I built this lock-in amplifier when I was about 12 years old, back in 1974. Many people regard this as the world's first wearable computer. It's a lock-in amplifier, a computing system that drives 35 electric light bulbs and makes pattern and, and makes the world visible, the otherwise invisible world visible. Of course, it still runs, it still works. Here, here it is, close up, and this is a picture that I took with it of the surveillance camera with 35 electric light bulbs on a stick waving back and forth in front of the surveillance camera. I call that the sequential wave and printing machine, the SWIM, because it can also make see radio waves and sound waves. This is the world's first photograph of an electromagnetic radio wave from 1974. And there it is, is a sort of crawling wave. And then if I get it just right down, where down by sit. I call that a sitting wave. We all know what standing waves are. If you have a violin or a skipping rope, you've got standing waves. Uh, and there's a comparison of standing waves with what I, what I call sitting waves, which are these sort of waves sitting still by sharing the space-time continuum at just the right angle that the... Uh, uh, Speed of light is exactly zero in that set of coordinates. This is the device here that I built on exhibit at the National Gallery, and it was at the Smithsonian Institute of Computer History Museum, world's first, world's first wearable computer. It still runs, it still works. And uh, my daughter made this when she was nine years old. She grabbed my machine and put it on her own race car track and made this little thing, the electric fields in, in green, and the, they made the field magenta of this microwave motion sensor, which is otherwise impossible to understand. Even if you put it on an oscilloscope, you can't understand it. But when you spatialize it in space, it's really easy to understand. An oscilloscope shows you things as a function of time, but this shows you waveforms as a function of space, overlaid in perfect alignment with the world they're in. I called it phenomenal reality. Nowadays, people would use the term augmented reality or something like that. And I've got one, I've still got a re modern replica of my childhood experiment. This is, a, this is a smartphone that I built. I like to build smartphones. This is a 10 gigahertz smartphone with a uh, modulation carrier. It doesn't completely work, but it's a start. You know, but I want, it doesn't do a Google chat and uh, this is uh, the swim. So now you can see the radio waves from the smartphone are stronger and much closer to the smartphone and weaker when it's further away. So you can see getting close to strong and further away from the weaker. And if I go to the table here, you can see the waves are attenuated by the table. So this part of the table stops by the end of the waves. If I go to the flat, you can see here. 
that doesn't have much to do But if I put my hand over the speaker, it's more different. But if I put my hand over the speaker, it's more different. You can see the signal is all weak. And the hand is not going to be one finger, two fingers, three fingers, four fingers. So you can see, obviously, if I hold my phone like this, nobody can hear me. See how long I can use that. There's some gravitational waves. There's uh, this is meta sensing here because there's a microphone here. It doesn't emit physical quantity, but it has the capacity to listen. And what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing the microphone's capacity to listen. There's a microphone hidden in this little stuffed animal. And what we see here is its capacity to listen. And it's a valence wave function that gets stronger when you're closer and weaker when you're further away. And um, if you take its Hilbert transform times the square root minus one added on, then you get the strength, which is the probability that the microphone will hear your voice as a function of how close you are. This is my office in Silicon Valley, San Mateo. And uh, I've got a, I made this desk out of a single slab of solid redwood because I want a nice augmented reality desk. And there's a violin there, and what we see is the sound waves from the violin. This is a photograph of the sound waves, not computer graphics. You can see the reflection of the waves in the window over here on the right. And on the table, I made that table out of redwood as well. So I kind of nice little set of furniture there. And here um, we're interacting with these waves. And you can see the kind of shaping and sculpting in this mediated reality meta metaverse. And uh, these sculptures I have on the wall, this is called burner foam. This is a piece of wood that I burned with a laser into the wood to burn the waveform that's coming from the phone directly into the wood. And so we can interact and see and understand sound waves, for example, from a violin, and therefore design musical instruments by being able to see the sound coming from them. Here's the action potential for my ulnar nerve, and this is this allows me to see the electricity flowing along my nerves, and so we're collaborating with Stanford Neurosurgery, developing technologies to help neurosurgeons see. So those are electrodes on my hand there from the bowel group, research new kinds of electrodes and new kinds of signals. I can see brain waves and how the brain waves are affected by the electromagnetic radio waves of the smartphone, for example. And so this is an interesting little teaching tool, meeting various people. There's the governor of Szechuan province. There's the amplifier. In the lower right there, we have the world's most advanced lock-in amplifier, which is a collaboration between Man Lab and Sun Yat-sen University. I noticed when I, in, in the United States, the, the best amplifier that was ever made in human history is the PAR-124A amplifier from 1961. And at Stanford last year, when I was at Stanford, all their super sensitive research they're doing with this more than 50-year-old amplifier. And they got... Uh, uh, in most big universities where they got lots of money, they buy up these old amplifiers from 53 years ago or whatever. And there's a guy in Texas who still fixes them. So someone will pay like $10,000 for an old amplifier that's more than 50 years old and then send it to Texas and spend a bunch more money to get them to calibrate it and test it and everything and get it shipped back. And that's what they use to conduct all their scientific research because the best amp uh, in America, a better amplifier has not since been built. And uh, what we did, what I wanted to do set out is to build this best amplifier in the world, which is now made in China. So we kind of reached this point where America re uh, reached a kind of peak, and then now we're moving to Shenzhen to make the best things in the world. People of all ages can understand this kind of thing. There's another, this is an experiment I did from my high school showing sound waves and interference. There's two microphones and a capacity to listen, and then we can see how it varies as a function of the spacing between the two microphones. There's two Shure SM58 microphones, similar to one I'm holding on to right now, and that's the interference pattern between the capacity to listen. Uh, there's constructive and destructive nodes here. This is just a single microphone, and we can see the complex valued wave function of its capacity to listen where the color is the phase and the brightness is the magnitude. 
So this is these are some inventions. One of my inventions is the NUI nat natural user interface. Um, this is a this is valence. Again, a more modern version of the valence. The swing is much away from printing machine. To be able to see this is meta vision, the vision of vision, Internet of Things. Of course, we can see how things can see. Inspecting lenses and looking for lens defects. And this is our meta vision interaction. Sharing the space time continuum. So, this is kind of growing up. This is sort of my history, an interesting little past. So, I started out building these wearable computers. And then uh, some people said, Oh, Steve Mann is the world's first cyborg because, you know, it's the first time a government organization recognized this passport photo. And people sometimes say that's the example of the cyborg self because it's an example of the sense of self or what is the self. This is the ITAP principle, attributely spectrum, the open ITAP project that we're working on to bring ITAP to the masses. And this is uh, founding the MIT Wearable Computing Project. back almost 30 years where I, I kind of invented this image stitching where you can look around your panoramas and share them and experience and see eye to eye and other people's life. So Nicholas Necropondi, the director of our lab, you know, recognized this as a new discipline or a new field of research. Another one of my inventions is HDR, high dynamic range imaging. And that uh, this is my really welding helmets that embodies HDR in most, sort of, most smartphones that has that. That function. So that's something I invented back in the 1980s and early 1990s. This is it here HDR high dynamic range imaging combining multiple different exposure. Here's an example from a photographic camera. So you see there's four images there on the left, and then they're combined on the right. This runs at 120 frames per second. I did it in hardware in using FPGA based architecture originally. Now I have a quantographic camera on my phone so that I can see the welding process on my head up and see it. The special camera can be mounted on or in a welding helmet or on a tripod or on a special stand with the tails of this. And there's some real time augmented reality overlay, augmented reality because it's both augmenting and diminishing to help us see, diminishing the bright arc. And there's a uh, the first time in human history we've been able to see the tape welding process right from the tip of the tungsten electrode clearly as well as the weld bubble formation. Of course this can be used for self-driving cars and many other technologies like that. We're working with 
other companies and bringing the self-driving car to market. This is a this is our one of our products. So this is a, an example of sort of hands interactive, you know, gesture-based wearable computing. One of the inventions, this was work I did more than 30 years ago, gesture-based wearable computing that is now making its way into products. And this, here's the world's first contact lens display in 1999, 19 years ago. So 18 years ago, world's first implantable computer. My invention was in 50 best of time. And uh, the brain sensing headband is another one. And um, this is a product that we've got in Best Buy stores all across North America. And it's on Amazon.com. Started in my house, actually, my students and I just started running a business and kind of grew from there. Our latest product is a little bit more like normal eyeglasses, and, you, and there's a Ax Shenzhen uh, company here building eyeglasses that might be interested in collaborating with us. up with all kinds of sensors to sense everything about my body and its surroundings. And then, like many of these things, it went from a crazy prototype into a commercially successful product. Here's another uh, of my inventions. This is the world's first smartwatch I made in 1998, cover of Linux kernel 2000. And then, you know, about 20 years later, or so we see this uh, as, a, as a commercial product. So. Many of these inventions uh, are having impact. And what we 
hope doing now is with Man Lab Shenzhen. We started, I started a lab in California and a lab in Shenzhen. We're hoping to build something. And what, what happened is uh, the, the mayor of Chengdu wrote me a letter and, and said, hey, you want to come and start a Man Lab here in China? And he said, he told me, he said, I, I want to make a Steve Man Town. And I said, what does that mean? Does that mean I'd be sheriff? And, uh, and uh, it was, what his idea was a district, you know, innovation district, because they have cloud computing district and Internet of Things district. We said, you know, you're the father of wearables. I want to make a wearables district, a wearable technology. And then some other people heard about that, and I got contact by the um, Chengdu and Zhuhai and all kinds of other cities to do the same thing. And Shenzhen, uh, we're building this, so we started this Man Lab Shenzhen, and Chinese government put uh, Man Lab Shenzhen as one of the top ten companies to land in uh, Shenzhen this year. So we got this, uh, my student, uh, Arkin, and I, together with Nick over there, uh, we, we co-founded a company, Vision Tech, in Shenzhen in 2005. And so we've been kind of growing here. And my wife lives in Hong Kong, so I have a lot of reason to be here. My daughter is actually in Hong Kong right now, so I'll be going to visit and uh, connect with her again. And so it's been really fun, you know, living uh, living in California and then finally kind of finding our, our home here almost in, in Shenzhen. It's a beautiful place. So uh, it's very much dear to my heart. I love this building. It's just like there's a store called Active Surplus in Toronto that was kind of like this building here, but it closed down, unfortunately, and I ended up buying most of the things that were in there and taking several loads of uh, items back. And uh, But this place is really alive. You know, I really like this place. It's got authenticity, the integrity of authenticity. A lot of people say they're into hardware, but you walk in and there's nothing. You know, it's just a desk or whatever. This is really fun. It's really a great place to be. It's really an honor to be here. So I look forward to collaborating and, and uh, doing something fun. Be happy to answer some questions. So I think I had told you about 30 minutes for a bit of a time, but uh, if you still have time, and uh, Steve, you also have time, then uh, we'll be happy to take some questions or anything you might want to say. Yeah, just speak loudly. So it's, it's a really cool philosophy, the notion of surveillance and knowing just what's being seen. But how do you deal with that technically for passive devices that don't emit signals telling you what they can see? Well, you know, like the PR124A locking amplifier that was built in 1961, it has a gain of about 10 billion. And the ability to ignore noise signals that are about a million times stronger. Uh, so when you have that much gain, something changes. You know, when you take the, the light bulb, I built, when I was 12 years old, I built the world's most powerful lock-in amplifier to drive a, a two and a half kilowatt drive capacity. So I often plugged in a one and a half kilowatt light bulb because back then 1500 watt light bulbs were pretty standard. And you put a 1500 watt light bulb in a room and shine it brightly. A camera that's in the room pick, uh, changes itself somehow there's some electrical change, and if you amplify that 10 billion times, then something different happens in that. Now, I'm not the inventor of the bug sweeper. There's lots of bug sweepers around. You can go online and find all kinds of devices and find hidden cameras and bug sweeping and find hidden microphones and sensors and everything. So this sensing of sensors is not new. Even radar detectors, the police have radar, and then consumers have radar detectors. And then the police have radar detector detectors. And then there's radar detector detector detectors, and so on. And that's meta sensing. And you see the sensing of sensing. It's well, it, it, it exists, you know. I, I, and, and it's not even something that I invented. What I invented is a way of visualizing, of, of like a way of aligning it perfectly with reality. So my contribution is like this thing here that. There's radio waves. Oscilloscopes existed before this. You know, you could plot radio waves on oscilloscopes, and all these things existed. But what I did is created this phenomenological reality or phenomenal reality. I created this way of seeing it aligned perfectly with what's really there, to have a camera and see exactly what's there. I didn't invent the lock in amplifier, because those things existed since the 1950s, really. 
Um, but what I did do is invent uh, the notion of phenomenological reality and the embodiment of it. And so it's going to be a teaching tool. You could put this in schools for children to learn how things work and see and understand the world. Um, that sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. When you're talking about feedback loops, I saw you had a new harvest in the slide deck. Um, I guess that's being mediated by cortex at some level and sort of like that into new inputs and making senses. But um, I think I remember reading at one point, uh, it was some of your early prototypes, you had headaches from sensory overload. Or I'm curious what, you, what, the, uh, what the limits are of cortex to process and understand things and sort of how fast you can. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's there's a sensory mapping and crazy things, you know. As children, we often do really stupid things to discover the world around us, you know. We try all kinds of crazy things. And, you know, like all the things that I did with sticking things into my body and, you know, crazy things like that. And, uh, over excessive, you know, uh, closed loop feedback systems and all that. But we converged on some commercial products that have been successful in the marketplace by sort of stepping back to a more moderate universe. You know, and this is this, this whole thing of, of, of modification, uh, you know, mind body modification, and how these things change us. A lot of these technologies really do change us, you know, in, in fundamental ways. I've, I've written extensively about that on even the moral and ethical grounding of it. You know, the, the, we wrote a paper on the economic, moral, and ethical grounding of, of surveillance. You know, that valence, that societies that adopt surveillance uh, without surveillance are inherently going to be economically less prosperous than valence societies. So maybe for later questions, if you can also mention like what you're working on, that would be good. Maybe Rohan, do you want yeah, to share that uh, as well? Yeah, uh, to context. Uh, CG, that oh, that's cool. So you can feel your own heart. Oh, that's super cool. We did some work on HRV. So one of my inventions is called the chirplet transform. You can search it. Chirplet transform. And it's used for HRV. It's um, like a wavelet, but it, it's the procedure. Yeah, uh, wavelets are, are often used for ECB. And uh, so if you search for the wonders that you get, 